Hi, good morning. Um, it's very strange to be up. Very strange to be up here. This is a very much a new experience. When Helen first approached me about presenting a talk on Lenten music in place of a sermon, my first my first thought was, "Are you for real?" Then my second thought was, "Oh boy." And then after starting my research into the topic again, is Helen having me on? The reason for the latter was that it quickly became clear that to make a talk on music in Lent is kind of amusing, because historically, it's the very season when we don't have music. Well, often it was canceled. It's true in Baroque Leipzig, uh, for example, where quiet time was observed between Ash Wednesday and Easter. Only the Feast of the Annunciation was celebrated with a cantata, even if it fell in that time. Of course, however, this was not the case everywhere. Where music was heard during Lent, it was performed mostly a cappella or unaccompanied. Just as a reminder of where we have actually come from, there are six Catholic no-nos during the season. Number one, no instrumental music unless accompanying voices. Number two, no singing or saying the Gloria. Three, no singing or saying the Alleluia before the Gospel. No flowers on the altar. Number five, no emptying holy water fonts. And number six, no veiling crosses before the sixth Sunday of Lent. Despite the restrictions that were placed on composers, there has actually been an abundance of beautiful music composed and performed for Lent when we're trying to find ourselves in relation to Christ. So Helen is for real, and she understands that there's a lot that I could talk about today. The beauty of the character of this season might be lost on people in the modern world, because the idea of penance is not so very popular today. But just as we need desperately the season of winter, as we say at St. Matthew's, for the heart. We need the season of Lent as an introverted preparation for Holy Week and its glorious finale. For composers who are quite often introverted people, Lent offers great inspiration. Take, for example, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, Palestrina's Stabat Mater, and Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath, that is often heard in the Requiem Mass, like that of Mozart's. Then there are works that offer comfort amid the torment. Music like the reflection piece today, God So Loved the World by Stainer. Eric Johnson states that, in a way, Lenten music began before the church did. Jesus and the apostles sang Passover hymns on the first Holy Thursday, as testified by the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. The earliest Christians often sang of the passion and the death of Christ although their music is mostly lost. What we do know, however, is that these early hymns were monophonic and sung in unison. These chants are widely agreed to be the most penitential type of music, and thus are heard frequently during Lent, as are the Psalms. These chants prevailed right through the Middle Ages. They grew in complexity until they finally blossomed in the Renaissance into musical structures that began to match the grandeur of the buildings and the cathedrals housing their singers. We think of composers such as Josquin de Pré and Dufay in the 15th century, who began to set a tenor cantus, tenor cantus firmus with treble descants and faubourg on lines, mostly a sixth interval harmony beneath. Intervals, incidentally, play an important role. In early music, the more pure intervals, such as the octave, the fourth, and the fifth, are found over and above the intervals built on thirds. Though, it, though this music might, might sound strident to our modern ears, it kindles the appropriate emotions in us during the season of Lent. Thomas Tallis, working under various English monarchs, in the 1500s, he saw much conflict within the church, especially between Protestant and Catholic church. And he was actually a, a real survivor. He, um, he went with the tired often, and so whoever was in power, uh, he wrote the, the right music for them. 
So he was good at keeping his job. But despite all the conflict that he saw, he left us beautiful consoling music appropriate for Lent, such as the Lamentations of Jeremiah. An even greater work of his is the 40-part motet, Spem in Alium, Hope in Any Other. Um, the first line means he never put his hope in any other. That fully captures the sorrowful character of the season. The journey from Ash Wednesday through until Easter Sunday is perhaps the most important Christian journey of the year, and musically it reflects light coming out of darkness. Out of the Deep by Talus that will be heard at communion reflects this idea, and it's rising up a voice and by mod modulating up by means of a sharp at the end of its first phrase. There's some argument as to when Lent concludes. Some argue Palm Sunday, while others state that the season ends at the Last Supper on Maundy Thursday. For me to label Bach's St. Matthew and St. John Passions as Lenten, some may dispute, although they serve in text and music as worthy meditations before Easter. It's true that, uh, for example, uh, Bach's cantatas, they offer the most incredible treasure of, of consoling music um, and a, of obviously a spiritual consolation. And it's quite interesting when I'm thinking of uh, my friend Nicholas Butler, uh, for example, because he, I mean, he's, he's, not, a, he, he's not a Christian. He's, uh, he's half Jewish and he's half Pakeha. But it's incredible, incredible to me that um, in my early teens, he discovered Bach's music, um, which I'd already, <laughs> I was already playing almost every day. But he gets as much consolation from it as me now. And it doesn't matter that he's not a Christian. Um, and this is the power of, of music. And he, we will often, uh, every, probably on an average, about every month, he will come over on a Saturday night and we will just put on CDs of the cantatas and it will go for two or three hours and we just, we just talk occasionally. Um, it's just the most, it's, it's just such a, a lovely thing to have to, sh have to share with a friend, you know, is to be able to share that music. And it's, it's amazing that uh, a human being can speak to us so strongly who's been dead for 300 years. It's, it's in, he, he comes across the cosmos, you know, to, to us here. One cantata Bach wrote that is certainly written for Lent is number 54. The opening aria states, stand firm against sin, otherwise its poison seizes hold of you. Do not let Satan blind you, for to desecrate the honour of God meets with a curse which leads to death. These words are very typical of much of the libretto Bach used for his weekly cantatas austere and patronizing. But what I find wonderful is how such text is married to, to its exact opposite, the most serene and beautiful music one could ever find. Voluntary for today is also by Bach. It's Com Susa Todd, Come Sweet Death. Pablo Casals, the famous cellist, was in awe of this solemn sacred song 
and recorded it many times. For me, it is the most profound essay on the reality of death, and even without its text, the music paints the deep and conflicting emotions at play upon contemplation of the final act in our lives. I'd just like to say now that uh, after the um, service, I will be playing a few more examples on the piano um, over to the left of the church. Uh, so you're welcome to, to join with me. And it won't be necessarily about Lenten music, but just about church music in general. And it won't be another lecture. <laughs> um, one's enough. <laughs> Whatever season we look at in the Christian calendar, Advent, Epiphany, the evidence in my own passion is that the music written to convey divine love as we find in the Christ story, this music reaches depths that I have not ever found in what we label as secular. When composers seem to look up rather than sideways, they achieve an ecstatic beauty. Excitement and joy, true sorrow, pathos, and comfort, I will always come back to it. But what creates this difference? Countless composers have been inspired to write music on the basis of everyday human love, opera, madrigals, symphonies, and thousands of love songs. But for me, there's always a change in its quality that's difficult to explain. At St. Matthew's, we try to merge or at least marry these traditionally separate worlds that is the sacred and secular. For me, anyway, human love is divine. The conclusion I must make is that it shouldn't, shouldn't matter. Whatever inspires us in art or music to carry ourselves in the everyday world with better patience, compassion, kindness, and love must be worthy of God.